Defending the Earth, a dialogue between Murray Bookchin and Dave Foreman, published by South End Press, Boston, Massachusetts, 1991. Chapter 4 Racism and the Future of the Movement Jim Houghton I agree with Murray and Dave on their very strong and emphatic statement that this society is rotten to the core but I must insist that it was rotten from its very inception. We cannot simply seek a return to an imagined libertarian democratic past. While the Founding Fathers were talking about building a democracy in this country they were also dragging people here from Africa as slaves and were decimating Native Americans who were resisting the European occupation. Obviously the American conception of democracy was flawed right from the start. What has happened over the past 300 years has been the perfecting of a society based from its very beginning, on predatory behavior, a callous disregard for human life and the mad search for profit. This predatory behavior has also been directed from the very start, at the ecological community as well. When Native Americans freely inhabited North America, there was a great respect for the land and its non-human inhabitants. This has been lost since the European invasion. Not long after the Europeans arrived here with their indentured servants, slaves, and their aristocracy land became nothing more than real estate to be taken from tribal communities and divided up by white Europeans into private parcels and exploited for profit within an ever-expanding market. The wilderness was feared and hated by most white settlers. Wilderness like the Indians, stood in the way of the maximum exploitation of the New World. They both had to be destroyed. The modern environmental or ecology movement marks an important break with this corrupt worldview. I have a great respect for this movement. The ecological question is clearly the overriding ethical and survival question confronting the human race today. Yet, I wonder how profound a break with our nations past the ecology movement can actually spark if it is unwilling to also confront the question of racism. Racism has been the foundation of the American social system. Our country is a racist system from top to bottom. Racism has become so integral to American life that people don't even see it or respond to it any longer. To date the ecology movement has reflected this history more often than it has broken with it. The movement has often one-sidedly challenged our society's destructiveness towards non-human nature but ignored its ongoing and direct degradation of human beings particularly of poor people of color who are among the most victimized. The movement has all too often developed its program in ways that stand in conflict with the short and long-term needs of poor people of color all over the world. Because of its history as a predominantly white and middle-class movement, the environmental movement's vision has been incomplete and important alliances have not been made. These neglected alliances may hold the key to the future of the struggle for an ecological society. To their credit, both Murray and Dave have clearly identified capitalism as one of the greatest sources of danger for the world of life. They are right. We do live in a society where there is a ruling class that owns or controls all the basic resources and institutions of society where the very dynamics of the system require constant growth and exploitation, and where the general interest for grassroots democracy human solidarity and ecological balance is thwarted to meet the special interests of the ruling class. This raises the question, however, of how can we organize a broad-based movement that can fundamentally change the system. What we need to understand is that one of the most important keys to the ruling class being able to divide and conquer and wield its power, at least in this country, is racism. Historically racism has divided masses of ordinary Americans who are in reality natural and logical allies in the struggle against the destructive effects and underlying elite institutions of corporate capitalism. Racism has thus been a strategic disaster for any social movement in this country aiming at reform or fundamental change. There is perhaps no force that has been more divisive. We have seen it wreck or limit movements over and over again in our history. Can the ecology movement afford, either morally or strategically, to ignore racism and the importance of bridging the racial gap? Can it afford to concern itself only with wilderness areas and non-human life and ignore the degraded and unhealthy environments in the workplace in our urban communities, and in our rural areas that disproportionately affect working class people and poor people of color? Can it afford to lose potential allies because of its indifference or lack of knowledge? 
My question to Dave and Murray is what ideas do either of you have for building alliances across racial lines that can foster a broad-based ecological movement strong enough to make fundamental change? How can the ecological movement move to expand its base deepen its vision, and combat racism? Dave Foreman First of all, it is not going to be easy. Racism runs deep within our national history. I see it in my own family history. My ancestry is entirely Northern European. My family came to Calvert County, Maryland, in the early 1600s. They moved to the Shenandoah Valley. They followed Daniel Boone across the Wilderness Road into Kentucky displacing native tribal communities that had lived in the area for generations. For a while my family had a plantation there and owned slaves. They fell on hard times though, like many cotton farmers who wore out their land, and they ultimately lost the plantation. Most of my family ended up poor hillbillies in eastern Kentucky. I come from this American tradition that Jim has so eloquently criticized a tradition that gives little thought to the ethics of exploiting the land or people of color. I remember visiting relatives of mine in San Antonio, Texas back in the 1950s when the bathrooms were still segregated. At the time I didn't think anything about it. It was natural. That was just the way it was. I'm a product of this deeply entrenched racist tradition in the United States. Like other white environmentalists, it undoubtedly affects my politics and organizing. Yet I believe building alliances across racial lines can be done. For example in Los Angeles, the local Earth First group has been working with a predominantly black group in what's organizing against a toxic incinerator being built in the neighborhood. Such a campaign is a little outside of Earth First's usual focus on wilderness and endangered species, but it is an issue which clearly links the struggle for racial justice with an unpolluted environment. LA Earth First thought it would be a useful way to build a militant environmental alliance across racial lines. Ecological problems such as polluting incinerators, dangerous landfills, and toxic industrial waste sites are a huge survival issue for communities of color throughout this country. Indeed, poor communities, with high percentages of people of color, are far more likely to be chosen as the sites of such environmental and public health hazards than white and more middle-class communities. Environmentalists and civil rights groups can make common cause around such issues and they should. The predominantly white and middle-class anti-nuke alliances of the 1970s never fully appreciated this possible linkage of issues when they organized their direct action campaigns against nuclear power plants. They would undoubtedly have been much stronger if they had put greater effort in building alliances across racial lines. The issue was there, only the needed coalition building was missing. Happily a growing and militant, multiracial, grassroots movement for environmental justice is organizing around such issues in more and more poor communities across the United States. Note. For more information about the movement for environmental justice, see Robert Bullard, Dumping in Dixie, Race, Class, and Environmental Quality, Boulder, Westview Press, 1990, Dana Alston, ed., We Speak for Ourselves, Social Justice, Race, and Environment. End note. Groups such as the Highlander Folk Center in Tennessee have been providing training and leadership development for this movement, paying particular attention to encouraging the leadership of community women and people of color. I am very encouraged by such organizing. While it is not Earth First's primary organizing focus, I am glad other groups are taking it on. That is as it should be. I strongly believe that the big mainstream environmental organizations should provide strong financial and logistical support for such struggles and that radical white ecologists would also do well to participate actively in such grassroots organizing. I am convinced, however, that groups like Earth First do not have to shift their focus away from their primary goal of protecting wilderness areas and endangered species in order to build alliances across racial lines. It would be a huge mistake to believe that such organizing is irrelevant to communities of color. It may not seem like an obvious survival issue to African Americans who have been isolated in denatured, run-down urban areas and who are trying desperately to keep their heads above water and maintain their ravaged communities, yet it is ultimately relevant to their lives. 
protecting the rainforests is a question of survival for the planet, including the human species. Furthermore while most African Americans understandably have more immediate survival concerns, the rainforests are home to many indigenous tribal peoples and peasants who depend on the forests for their physical and cultural survival and who find the forest community inherently valuable and worthy of human respect. The international rainforest preservation movement has provided a wonderful cross-fertilization between indigenous tribal peoples and environmentalists in the United States, Japan, and Western Europe. This experience has deepened much of the U.S. ecology movement's perspective. I personally have learned a great deal from my interactions with these tribal peoples. I have come to strongly appreciate the need for the ecology movement to directly join the fight against imperialism and the continuing oppression of tribal peoples throughout the world. While we need to fight to protect the forest, we also need to fight to protect those tribal cultures which have historically lived in harmony with the forests and respected them. I am proud of the international support we have been able to muster for these people and for the fact that several tribal groups are using my book Eco Defense as a guide to fight logging and other forms of commercial encroachment on the ecological integrity of their forest communities. I have long believed it is important to understand the racial dynamic that underlies so much of the ecological crisis. We need to clearly face up to the fact that white males from North America and Northern Europe hold a disproportionate share of responsibility for the mess we're in, that upper and middle class consumers from the first world take an excessive portion of the world's resources and therefore cause greater per capita destruction than do other peoples. It is largely based on this understanding that the Earth First movement has developed such a great affinity with native groups throughout the world. Overall, they are in the most direct and respectful relationship with the natural world. Earth First has therefore tried to back such groups in common struggle whenever we can. Most Earth Firsters, for example are supportive of the Diné, Navajo, a big mountain in their struggle against the US government's plan to forcefully relocate them. Several have been working hard on that. I think white environmentalists should take on such struggles with much greater frequency and begin making important organizing connections to these communities and other people of color. However, one problem I have seen over and over again among a number of white organizers trying to build coalitions with people of color is that they get so caught up in their own white guilt that they put people of color on a pedestal and make them immune from questioning or criticism. This is a disaster for alliance building. It short circuits the learning process that needs to take place among all parties to an alliance. I think it is right and important for Jim to criticize the residual racism in the ecology movement and to criticize the ecology movement when it only values struggles for wilderness preservation and ignores or disparages the environmental and survival struggles of poor people of color. We have much to learn from such criticism. We have made numerous mistakes that need to be corrected. However, I also think it is right and important for ecology groups to criticize communities of color if they develop their programs without sufficient thought or appreciation for the planet. If an alliance is to be meaningful, the critical questioning has to go both ways. It is true that we do need to be concerned about the oppression of women, of workers, of people of color. But we must also remember that members of other species are among the most oppressed beings on the planet. Right now, we are waging an incredible war of genocide and domination against the natural world. So, while we should support the Diné people we should not pretend that severe overgrazing by domesticated sheep does not occur on the Navajo reservation. While we support subsistence lifestyles by natives in Alaska wilderness, we should not be silent about clear-cutting of old-growth forest in southeast Alaska by native corporations, or about the efforts of the Eskimo Doyen Corporation to push for oil exploration and development in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We do, however, need to be thoughtful and respectful in how we criticize and question each other. Alliance building efforts can be destroyed as much by inappropriate criticism as they can by uncritical silence, finding the creative middle ground is not often easy. I think Earth First has sometimes failed to criticize our allies in the mainstream environmental movement productively. The slogan of Earth First is no compromise in defense of Mother Earth. But what exactly does no compromise mean? 
it means waging confrontational struggles against ecocidal corporations and government agencies, of course. Yet too often when you fight regularly with powerful and intransigent institutions you can't get out of that mode of interaction when you are among actual or potential friends and discussing your differences. We often relate to our potential allies with the same strident, provocative, no compromise attitude. This makes productive dialogue very difficult. We must guard against this. There are some real differences of opinion and differences of perception among those active on various issues. These can't be wished away or ignored. Yet, we need to find an open, cooperative, and compromising way of talking together and weaving our disparate struggles into a unified movement. I think there was a mechanism in primal cultures for that if you went out to hunt or to raid horses or to engage in a skirmish with another group of people you went through certain rituals to prepare yourself for that. However, before you were reintegrated back into your own community you had to go through certain purification rituals to make sure you fully found your way back. That is something we have forgotten how to do. If we are really going to learn how to cooperate across racial, class, or experiential lines, we need to learn how to fight like hounds from hell against those institutions which threaten us all while at the same time we maintain a sense of community and connection among ourselves, even as we struggle to resolve our own differences. We need to recognize that these contradictions among ourselves are different from the contradictions between all of us and the guardians of the imperial status quo. Establishing such guidelines on how to approach critical discussions across racial lines is purely academic, however, unless people are in actual contact with each other and talking together. Without actual contact, we simply will not realize how we're part of the same struggle and that we ultimately need each other. How we get there from here, how we overcome past divisions, and how we make connections is a very difficult question. I've already given some examples of how the ecology movement can make such alliances through common, coalition struggles. These efforts should be expanded, but I think environmentalists need to push themselves at a more personal level as well. Building bridges among communities and movements also has a very personal and individual dimension to it. We need to seek out chances to learn about each other's lives interests, and concerns. While I was in federal custody after I got busted by the FBI, I met a number of people in jail that I ordinarily would not have come across in my daily life. Since I had been on TV, I was sort of a celebrity prisoner. Everybody wanted to take me under their wing and show me around. While in jail, I met a number of illegal aliens and heard many stories about the border patrol and living along the US-Mexico border. It was conversations like these that helped me understand how the border patrol and the so-called drug war are part of an effort to create the apparatus and public acceptance for a racist police state in this country. Such conversations have significantly expanded my political concerns and perspectives. Environmentalists also have much to contribute to the perspectives of many poor communities of color which have been forcibly divested of their direct connections with the land and isolated in decaying urban environments. I think that Outward Bound and other groups like it have done some good work setting up programs to get inner city people of all ethnic backgrounds out into the wilderness in order to enrich their lives and expand their appreciation of the wild world. I have taken my sisters in laws, who are working class Hispanics, on raft trips through the river canyons of northern New Mexico to try to make the same connection. My nephew has become a wildlife fanatic. He probably has the longest life list of birds of any kid in New Mexico. I've also been talking about all of this with Bunyan Bryant who is possibly the only black professor of natural resources in the country. We are currently planning a raft trip to bring together a select group of people to talk about how to work together to help restore and deepen the lost ecological awareness of so much of the urbanized African American community. Ultimately however, I have no firm and final answers to Jim's questions. These are just some initial thoughts in a complex process. It will likely take a few generations of hard work, at least, to thoroughly overcome the social wounds that divide us and inhibit our full cooperation. I don't think forming a large, all-encompassing, movement organization that aims at effectively addressing all of our issues is practical or wise right now. I think any attempt along these lines will collapse of its own weight. 
What I think we need now is a greater effort to cooperate and learn from each other as well as a greater acceptance for the diversity of our primary interests and emphases. This seems to me the best framework for cooperation and alliance building right now. Perhaps a good analogy for what we need today would be the hunter-slash-gatherer tribe which often splits into small family bands of just a few people and then, a few times a year, comes together as a larger group for socialization and exchanging ideas, experiences, and, how should I say it, genetic material. I think we need to view the larger movement as an increasingly powerful river with many currents in it. Sometimes those currents may flow separately, sometimes they are going to directly merge and flow together. All of these currents, however, are still part of the same river. The trick is to make sure all these currents flow in the same direction. Let's face it, there is a big ugly dam downstream that we need to topple over and break apart. We are going to need to cooperate if we are going to be strong enough to do that. We need to make the effort to build alliances now. In closing, let me just quote Henry David Thoreau, let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. Note. Henry David Thoreau, Civil Disobedience in the Portable Thoreau, New York, Penguin Books, 1975, 120. End note. Murray Bookchin I am moved by Jim's and Dave's remarks. One of my major complaints about deep ecology is that it lacks a clearly developed social analysis and ethics. It thus provides a tolerant philosophical home to profoundly conflicting ideas and sensibilities, from humanistic naturalists in the tradition of Thoreau to barely disguised racists. Today Dave seems to be standing with the former. I welcome this after some of the misanthropic and neo-Malthusian articles I've encountered in Earth First in the recent past. Over the years, some of the most visible spokespeople of Earth First have clearly fallen into the latter category. Slogans like Rednecks for Wilderness are, at the very least, insensitive and unlikely to build bridges across racial differences. Such a slogan is charged with racist overtones for African Americans. More dangerous still have been the published statements by prominent deep ecologists associated with Earth First Calling Aids, which has been particularly devastating in the black and gay communities an environmentalist's dream come true, or dealing with famines in Ethiopia as a sad but presumably necessary means of controlling third world population, or viewing Latin American Hispanics as culturally morally generically inferior people who should be barred from emigrating to the United States and using up our resources. The problem, of course is not deep ecology's stated commitment to foster a new sensibility towards the natural world. All radical ecologists agree on the need to go beyond the limited environmentalist perspective that sees nature as merely a passive inventory of natural resources and defines appropriate human interaction with the natural world as merely using these resources efficiently and prudently without threatening the biological sustainability of the human species. Whatever our differences about nature philosophy both deep and social ecologists call for a direct and profound respect for the biosphere, a conscious effort to function within its parameters, and an attempt to achieve harmony between society and the natural world. I believe that all social activists should embrace this new sensibility towards nature. The main problem with deep ecology's philosophy however, is that this is about as far as it goes. It does not highlight or systematically address the social roots of the ecological crisis. It does not document or interpret the historical emergence of society out of first, or biological, nature, a crucial development that brings social theory into organic contact with ecological theory. It presents no explanation of, indeed, it reveals little interest in the emergence of hierarchy out of early organic society of classes out of hierarchy of the state out of classes in short, the highly graded social as well as ideological developments which are at the roots of the ecological problem. Indeed, it is hardly more insightful about these questions than the reformist environmental movement. Thus, even when individual deep ecologists show concern for harmonizing relationships between races, genders, and classes, their concern does not stem from a coherent expression of deep ecology philosophy. Rather it is expressed only as an external ethical and social commitment that may, or may not, for that matter, 
be added to a deep ecology perspective. Women, poor folks, and people of color are right, I think, to be very wary of a philosophy which interprets vital questions of human solidarity, democracy, and liberation as optional and secondary concerns, at best, and evidence of anti ecological or anthropocentric selfishness, at worst. Ecological philosophy, if it is to provide a solid basis for alliance building, must be a social ecology that critiques and challenges all forms of hierarchy and domination, not just our civilization's attempt to dominate and plunder the natural world. It must set as its overarching goal, the creation of a non-hierarchical society if we are to live in harmony with nature. Our present society has a definite hierarchical character. It is a propertied society that concentrates economic power in corporate elites. It is a bureaucratic and militaristic society that concentrates political and military power in centralized state institutions. It is a patriarchal society that allocates authority to men in varying degrees. And it is a racist society that places a minority of whites in a self-deceptive sovereignty over a vast worldwide majority of peoples of color. While it is theoretically possible that a hierarchical society can biologically sustain itself, at least for a time, through draconian environmentalist controls, it is absolutely inconceivable that present-day hierarchical and particularly capitalist society could establish a non-domineering and ethically symbiotic relationship between itself and the natural world. As long as hierarchy persists, as long as domination organizes humanity around a system of elites, the project of dominating nature will remain a predominant ideology and inevitably lead our planet to the brink, if not into the abyss, of ecological extinction. Social ecology provides a better foundation for alliance building and a respectful unity in diversity because it understands that the very concept of dominating nature stems from the domination of human by human, indeed, of the young by their elders, of women by men, of one ethnic or racial group by another, of society by the state, of one economic class by another, and of colonized people by a colonial power. It thus stresses all the social issues that most deep ecologists and reform environmentalists tend to ignore, often downplay, or badly misunderstand. From this perspective, the fight against racism is not just a mere political item that can be added to defending the earth, it is actually a vital and essential part of establishing a truly free and ecological society. The difficult work of building alliances across ethnic lines is thus seen, as Jim so correctly says, as a moral as well as strategic imperative for the ecology movement. I feel this moral imperative very deeply. Back in the early 1940s, I worked and served as a union steward in a foundry where over 80% of my fellow workers were black. As a result of this experience, I was able to see the lives of my African American brothers in all their richness and their oppression. I experienced this again working in the civil rights movement during the late 1950s and early 1960s with the Congress of Racial Equality. Today I feel I am witnessing not only racist exploitation. I am witnessing the very destruction of the black community. I see genocide at work against black people and other people of color throughout the cities of America. It horrifies me. 24% of all black males in New Haven between the ages of 20 and 30 now have AIDS viruses. These people are not being helped, their fate is being acknowledged as just another statistic in the reports of the Public Health Service. The horror of racism today which has dramatically intensified since I first confronted it in the 1930s and 1940s, violates every sense of justice I feel. The ecology movement must stand firmly against racism and actively participate in the struggle against it. One of the chief obstacles to building alliances across ethnic lines manifests itself at the programmatic level. One of the truisms of the environmental movement is that our society has reached ecological limits to its overall growth at the global level. Environmentalists thus call for limits on economic expansion, population growth, and individual consumption. There is a great deal of validity to such demands. I have long argued that we must transform our bloated, urbanized, and rapacious society into a confederation of eco-communities that are sensitively tailored in size, population, technology, and consumption to the specific ecosystems in which they are located. 
but when these demands are not set clearly within the context of a struggle for a non-hierarchical society appeals for limits to growth are almost inevitably turned into racist and draconian measures by the powers that be to ensure the sustainability of hierarchical first world societies at the expense of the material needs of third world people. It should not come as a surprise then, that for many activists of color environmentalism has come to mean little more than racist measures for blocking needed economic improvements and for intensifying austerity among people of color in this country and in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. It has also come to mean a vicious policy of limiting the surplus population of people of color throughout the world through starvation, disease, and forced sterilization. It is bad enough when reform environmentalists are naively complicit with this perversion of valid ecological objectives. It is shocking to me, however, when self-identified deep ecologists actively embrace such measures and call their views radical ecology. I may have seemed very disputatious in dealing harshly with these tendencies in the ecology movement but I think my zealousness is justified. Such views make productive alliances across ethnic lines nearly impossible. I cannot be mellow on this point. Both explicit and implicit racism must be challenged and uprooted from within our movement. To ignore this need is to court moral and strategic disaster. Besides making the changes I've urged here in our ecological philosophy and the way we develop and articulate our program, I am convinced that the best way to build productive alliances across ethnic lines is for the radical ecology movement to adopt libertarian municipalism as one of its major strategies for change. We certainly need the direct action campaigns of Earth First to defend wilderness areas. Yet, if we are really going to move towards an ecological society based on confederated, democratic communities artfully tailored to our ecosystems, we also need to develop a new grassroots municipal politics. As I said before, we need to develop our tactics of nonviolent direct action, community organizing, and local electoral politics into a strategy geared towards gaining direct democratic control of our communities and transforming them along the lines suggested in my response to Linda Davidoff. If we are to be effective, radical ecologists must try to create organic communities organic no less in their respect for land, flora, and fauna than in their attempts to foster human solidarity grassroots democracy and social support systems. We can already see the seeds for such a movement. I agree with Dave that local issues such as the siting of nuclear reactors or nuclear waste dumps, the dangers of acid rain, and the presence of toxic dumps, to cite only a few of the many problems that beleaguer innumerable American municipalities, have already united an astonishing variety of people into grassroots movements which transcend traditional class, ethnic, and social barriers that have historically divided our communities. I fully agree with Jim that vital coalitions between ecologists and people of color that challenge the state and corporations are quite possible at the local grassroots level. Over the last few decades, Demands for local community control have yielded a multitude of block associations, tenants groups, alternative institutions, neighborhood alliances, and multiracial citizen action groups. The town meeting, or citizens' assembly initially a New England institution, is becoming a byword in regions of the United States that have no shared tradition with the Northeast. Community action groups have also begun to enter into local politics, a terrain that was once the exclusive preserve of elite party machines. They are doing this on a scale that is beginning to affect municipal policy making. Grassroots politics, specifically popular municipal politics, is becoming an integral part of U.S. politics as a whole. While it has yet to find a coherent voice and a clear sense of direction, I hope it is here to stay and will work its way, however confusedly, into the real world of the political landscape. Put bluntly a latent dual power must emerge in which the local base of society begins to challenge the authority of its seemingly invulnerable state and corporate apex. I think we can develop such a tendency in North America today. I think it possible, if a highly conscious, well-organized, and programmatically coherent libertarian municipalist movement develops in the next decades, for the people to reconstruct society along lines that could foster a balanced, well-rounded, and harmonious community of interests among each other and between humanity and nature. Such an approach is not a utopian dream, it is an urgently needed strategy for our own time. 
Because of automation, the flight of capital, and the emerging global division of labor, a number of U.S. cities and towns have been transformed in the eyes of corporate and government elites from sites for maintaining essential human resources into a dumping ground for superfluous human waste. To varying degrees, cities like New York, Detroit, and St. Louis have been set adrift by the corporations and the state. They have been abandoned to their squalor and to a leprous process of decay. Not surprisingly given our country's racist history, people of color comprise residential majorities in many of these cities. Owing to the decline of municipal services in these largely abandoned cities, a vacuum is developing between the traditional institutions that manage the city and the urban population itself. Understaffed and underfunded municipal agencies can no longer pretend to adequately meet such basic needs as sanitation, education, health, and public safety. An eerie municipal no-man's land is emerging between the traditional, decaying institutional apparatus of these cities and the people it professes to serve. As a result, many affluent city dwellers have abandoned their communities. Many of the poor remain and are lost in despair, crime, violence, and drug addiction. Others, however, have become organizers and active citizens. These people are taking the first steps towards altering the social, political, economic, and natural landscape of their communities. They have stepped in to fill the void. Radical ecologists must support these active, civic-minded citizens and work closely with them. While most social theorists still seem to lack a sufficient awareness of the public's power to create its own political institutions and forms of organization, there are many examples of that power that encourage me. One of my favorites is drawn from New York in the late 1970s. It was called the East 11th Street Movement. Initially, the movement was a Puerto Rican neighborhood organization, one of several in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which formed an alliance with some young ecologically oriented radicals to rehabilitate an abandoned tenement that had been completely gutted by fire. The block itself, one of the worst in the Hispanic ghetto, had become a hangout for drug addicts, car strippers, muggers, and arsonists. After being illegally taken over by community squatters, the building was totally rebuilt by co-opers, composed for the most part of Puerto Ricans a few blacks, and some whites. The movement's attempts to acquire title to the building, to fund its rehabilitation, and expand its activities to other abandoned structures were to become a cause celebre that inspired similar efforts both in the Lower East Side and other areas. The building was taken over even before negotiations with the city had been completed. The city government was patently reluctant to assist the co-opers and had to be subjected to strong local pressure before supplying any aid. Ultimately the building itself was not only rebuilt but was ecologically retrofitted with energy-saving devices, insulation, solar panels for heating water, and a wind generator to supply some of its electric power. There was talk of rooftop gardens, waste recycling, and turning abandoned lots nearby into neighborhood vest pocket parks. It would take too long to give a full account of the struggles of the East 11th Street movement. Yet, I'm pleased to say that a number of people from the Institute for Social Ecology played an inspirational and technical role in these projects. Here, I think, is a little-known and remarkable example of how young white social ecologists worked hand-in-hand -hand with oppressed Hispanic people to reclaim a human habitat in a truly ecological manner. Perhaps the most significant feature of this struggle was its left libertarian ambience. The rehab project was not only a fascinating structural enterprise, it was an extraordinary cooperative effort in every sense of the term. Politically the movement fought City Hall and it did so with an awareness that it was promoting decentralized neighborhood rights over the big city machine. Economically it fought the New York financial establishment by advancing a concept of labor, sweat equity, over the usual capital and monetary premises of investment. Ecologically this movement experimented with eco-technologies, renewable energy sources, and relative independence from the giant utilities. Socially. It encouraged neighborhood pride, social solidarity, and community self-activity. It was a marvelous example of social ecology in action which contrasts markedly with the flighty, self-indulgent, and sometimes misanthropic features I often find in deep ecology and middle-class environmentalism. 
from a desperate attempt to secure decent housing, a grassroots social ecology movement was born. Many other stories could be told about similar struggles in communities all over the country. That these grassroots movements are often ephemeral does not negate the existence of an underlying ferment and libertarian potential at the base of North American society. More importantly for the purposes of this discussion, the existence of such movements suggests that successful multiracial alliances can be built around such social ecological efforts. We need to be very careful in trying to build multicultural alliances, however. As I said earlier, one of the tasks of the radical ecology movement is to articulate a general human interest that transcends the real but particularistic interests of class, nationality, ethnicity, and gender in order to build alliances to reconstruct our communities along more humane and ecological lines. Yet we need to be wary of talking too glibly about the general human interest. Multiculturalism must mean more than mistaking the currently dominant culture as the universal and expecting other people to adopt the perspective of this dominant culture. This is not a productive transcendence of particularism. Unfortunately such a narrow universalist perspective has historically plagued predominantly white and middle class movements. It is thus all too easy for the ecology movement today to play fast and loose with concepts like the people and overlook particular class, ethnic, and gender interests that need to be forthrightly addressed within the larger context of a general human and planetary interest. Jim Houghton is right in saying that such unresolved divisions among the people not only violate basic principles of social ethics but will also decrease the likelihood of our creating a genuinely ecological society. To avoid this, radical ecologists, whatever their backgrounds, need to remain in close solidarity with the specific liberation struggles of people of color, women, children, gays, and lesbians, working people the jobless poor, and colonized peoples. While deep ecologists have rarely emphasized this, these coalitions are part of the needed social struggles against the age-old traditions and institutions of hierarchy and domination, traditions that have warped society for thousands of years and have destructively shaped humanity's attitude toward the natural world. Let's not be a party to this neglect any longer. If we are really committed to creating an ecological society we need to strive to make our lives a counter-friction to racism and all forms of domination and exploitation. This is an essential part of any genuinely radical ecological politics.